Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. One thing before we start the show. I want to let you know about a special interview you'll hear at the end of this episode. It's with the host of a brand new podcast called Art Architects, the architects of art. The cool thing is this show is hosted by Director X and Taj Critchlow, two of the biggest music video directors on the planet. These guys are responsible for game-changing videos from artists like Drake and Coldplay and Kendrick Lamar and so many more. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. I sure did. That's coming up at the end of this episode. All right, let's get on with things. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or in the case of music, the ear. What's pleasant to one person is nothing but noise to somebody else. This is where it's good to have some patience. There are some forms of art whose beauty isn't obvious at first. You need to stick with it. And after you've given it a chance and you've decided that it's not for you, well, okay, fine. But what about those times where something happens, suddenly or slowly, and either on your own or with the prompting of someone else, and you realize that the weird music you're listening to is actually pretty good? This is the payoff. And yeah, you really had to work hard for it, but it was worth it. Okay, you with me so far? Now, beauty doesn't mean perfect, at least not in the technical sense. Sometimes imperfection makes something more beautiful, or at least more interesting. Which brings me to the topic, once again, of singing voices. This can be a very subjective area. How many times have you said, listen to that guy, I can't stand his voice. How did he ever get a record deal? I mean, just, just listen to him. But then others hear the same thing and go, wow, that's really different, really expressive. It's full of character and emotion. What a bold move, giving this dude a chance to reach millions of people. I love this guy. These are the kinds of singers that we're about to review. Guys with some of the most unusual voices in the history of alt-rock. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Hi there, I'm Alan Cross, and I learned something long ago that when it comes to music, there is little that is right and wrong. Music comes from a weird place inside and can manifest itself in very weird ways. Singing is especially personal because this is the body as a musical instrument, and the sound it makes is influenced not only by the physical parameters of a given body, but also by what makes us sing in the first place. Things that are out of our control, things that are too painful to talk about, things that are too big and too amazing for mere words, things that are just too fantastical to be true. In other words, we're talking about feeling, that intangible thing that's impossible to put into mere words, that thing that comes from the gut, the heart, the thing that gives all music life, the thing that trumps everything else when it comes to making music. All right, I think I've made my point. On the last show, we went through a series of female singers who have, well, odd, unconventional, and unique ways of singing. That episode was called Queens of Quirk. Now we're going to do the same for the guys. What I want to do is play a series of songs by the kings of Quirk in some kind of effort to show how unusual and distinctive voices have made an impact on the evolution of alt-rock. Dudes have always had it much easier than women when it comes to being different. While women were put in a box and told, you must sing like this for years, men really had no such restrictions. I mean, look at Bob Dylan or Neil Young or ACDC's Bon Scott and Brian Johnson. We could even put Robert Plant and Rod Stewart on this list. And and don't even get me started on the Bee Gees and their falsetto records. Or maybe the bar for being a dude with a weird singing voice was just at a different level. Higher? Lower? I'm not sure. Take Lou Reed, for example. From the moment he started making records in the late 1950s, he really didn't follow the program when it came to singing. There's not much of a range here. He really speaks more than he actually carries any kind of a tune. And I guess when you get right down to it, it's more of a monotone drawl. There's no melody. There's not a lot of rhythm. And his timing with the music is often odd. Can you imagine someone like this doing well on American Idol or X Factor? (laughs) Are you kidding me? So there's the problem. Idol and The Voice and X Factor and Glee all push a very conservative approach to singing. Where would alt-rock be today if it hadn't been for Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground? 
Would it even exist as we know it? Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground from 1966. Other than Bob Dylan, no one was really singing like that back then. Dylan had a major record deal, but maybe it was because he came from the folk scene. Lou and the Velvets were from the streets of New York City and were just too weird for mainstream consumption. It wasn't so much Lou's voice, although that didn't help, as it was the band's subject matter. Too much sex and drugs with this rock and roll. Yet Reed's music found its way and influenced generations of musicians who liked the idea of being weird, even if it was just for the sake of being weird. Now, you have to understand that in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a certain everything-goes attitude at a lot of record labels. This was before everything became very corporatized and formal. And because rock was still a relatively young art form that was evolving quickly, A&R people were quicker to take a chance on something new because no one knew where things were going. Which brings me to A&M Records. It was headquartered in Los Angeles and had no trouble with the hippie ideals of the day. You're weird? You're experimental? Great! What you got? Maybe we'll get you a deal. And here's where we meet Captain Beefheart. His real name was Don Van Vliet, and he was a buddy of Frank Zappa's. He ended up attracting the attention of A&M Records, the, at the time, indie label co-founded by Herb Elpert. Yes, the guy from the Tijuana Brass. Beefheart was mainly a sculptor and a painter, but he was enthusiastic for all sorts of artistic expression, which inevitably led to music. He claimed to have never gone to public school, which is not true, but it makes for a great story. He was very dyslexic, and he was a major fan of rhythm and blues. Beefheart and his magic band were eventually signed to A&M in 1966, and over the years, the label indulged him a lot even though he would do things like show up with a loaded crossbow at the offices because he was angry that somebody dared critique his work. His magnum opus, the record that critics say is his best work, came out in 1969. It was a double album featuring 28 tracks that found favor with um, certain types of music fans. The Beatles said they liked it because it was so out there, and people who liked disagreeable music liked it precisely because it was disagreeable. They loved music that other people considered annoying or hateful. For example, Johnny Lydon of the Sex Pistols loved it. Matt Groening, the man who would later create The Simpsons, loved it. Film director David Lynch loved it. Okay, so that last one makes a lot of sense, but uh, anyway. Whatever the case, Trout Mask Replica has gone down in history as being a very important rock album. Some critics call it one of the greatest records of all time. Okay, so let me play you something. There is nothing wrong with your equipment. There is nothing wrong with my equipment. This song sounds this way on purpose. I cannot go back to your land of gloom Where black jagged shadows Remind me of the coming of your doom I want my own Captain Beefheart in Frownland from Trout Mask Replica, released in 1969. And uh, again, that song sounds like that by design. Now, can you imagine a major label dude signing a guy who sounded like that today and then giving him time and money to make a double album? It's fascinating. Tell you something, if you have a party and people are staying past the time when they should have gone home, put that record on the stereo. They'll go home quickly. But I have to stress again the importance of artists like Beefheart. If he could make a record, others thought, well, then so could I. It's okay to experiment. It's okay to be different. And that sort of thinking gave birth to Sparks. They were formed by Ron and Russell Mayo in Los Angeles in 1971. And if you want quirky rock, you can't go wrong here. Not only did it sound different, wait until you hear Russell Mayo's voice, but their lyrics were very clever, sophisticated even. They zigged and zagged through glam rock, art rock, chamber pop, electronic dance, power pop, and many of the spaces in between. And Ron Mail became famous for his Adolf Hitler-like mustache. And I should stress that's all he had in common with Hitler. Sparks is still together, still making music, but this song from 1974 remains their biggest hit. It's from an album entitled Kimono in My House, and this is called This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us.
Russell Mail and Sparks from 1974. This town ain't big enough for the both of us. When you hear Russell sing, you know it's him. Same thing with Dave Thomas, lead singer of Cleveland's Per Ubu. They came together in 1975 with Thomas as the lead singer. He's a big bear of a dude, but with a very high-pitched voice. It's a bit disarming until you get used to it. Per Ubu never ascended above cult status, but they came close to having a genuine alternative radio hit in 1989 with this song from an album called Cloudland. It's called Waiting for Mary. The very interesting Dave Thomas, no, no, not not the Wendy's guy, uh, singing with Per Ubu with Waiting for Mary from 1989. Still around, still a cult favorite. We'll continue our survey of unique male voices from the history of alt rock in just a second with a guy who was a giant favorite of David Bowie. In fact, Bowie even asked this guy to perform with him a number of times, including on Saturday Night Live. Stand by. The name of this show is Kings of Quirk, and we're taking a listen to some of the most distinctive male voices that we've heard over the history of alternative rock. Now, if you're a David Bowie fan, you've probably encountered the name Klaus Nomi. If not, let me introduce you. Klaus was German, and he loved opera. He even sang opera in a gay disco in West Berlin before moving to New York. And the more he performed, the more otherworldly he became you know, wild costumes and makeup and hair. And when he performed, there was always guaranteed to be smoke and strobes and explosions. It was a mix of opera, vaudeville, technopop, and new wave. And there was no one like Klaus Nomi. He became a fixture on the New York underground scene and was embraced by artists such as Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. And that's how Bowie heard about Klaus and rushed to see one of his live shows. And that led to Nomi's appearance with Bowie on Saturday Night Live. The date was December 15th, 1979. He sang back up on three songs. Here's the kind of thing that caught Bowie's attention. This is from Klaus Nomi's official debut album in 1981. Now remember, this is a guy. And bonus points if you can figure out what song Klaus is covering. That's Klaus Nomi with The Twist. Yes, the Chubby Checker song from his self-titled debut album in 1981. Told you it was different. Nomi died of AIDS-related complications, making him one of the first celebrities to die of the disease. And sadly, it's tough to find physical copies of his music these days. Although, there's always YouTube, right? Since we're still in the 70s, we need to bring up Tom Waits. I've often wondered how this guy managed to get a record deal, and I say that with all the joyous wonder I can muster. Thank God this guy got a deal, but can you imagine someone with this voice and this approach getting a major deal today? Be pretty tough. But back in 1972, there were labels like Asylum. Asylum was founded in 1971 by a couple of former show business agents at the William Morris Agency. There was David Geffen and his partner, Elliot Roberts. The label came about when one of Geffen's clients, some kid named Jackson Brown, couldn't get a record deal. So Geffen created his own indie label and signed Jackson Brown. And that did pretty well. Asylum was envisioned as a singer-songwriter's paradise. And just to be a little bit crazy, I mean, why else do you think the label was called Asylum on purpose? They got Joni Mitchell, Linda Ronstad, J.D. Souther, the Eagles. They all became members of the roster. And so did Tom Waits. He'd been working as a doorman at a nightclub in San Diego that liked to feature some, uh, well, idiosyncratic performers of the day. Tom caught the attention of Asylum because, like the other artists on the label, he was sort of folky at the beginning. He was also sort of jazzy, like Joni Mitchell, and because both Geffen and Elliot Roberts were both fans of Bob Dylan, a guy with a super unusual voice, they thought that Waits might be their Dylan. So they were open to experimenting with him. And besides, the California singer-songwriter thing was super hot at the time. So you can see all the different elements that had to come into play for a guy like Tom Waits to get a record deal. Now, it could still happen today, and, and it does, but these kinds of discoveries are almost exclusively the domain of indie labels. 
And Tom's vocal stylings did change over the years. He began as gruff and soulful, but, according to legend, he deliberately tortured his vocal cords with lots of whiskey and cigarettes to make him sound older and more world-weary. He's often named on lists of singers who cannot sing. Now, if you're not familiar with Tom, he has a huge body of work that extends back to before his asylum years. His big breakthrough was a 1976 album entitled Small Change, and this was a single from the record. And yes, it was written during the years Tom was a very, very hard drinker. As the piano has been drinking, the piano has been drinking, and you can't find your way through. Tom Waits and the Piano Has Been Drinking from his 1976 album Small Change. The guy has one of the most unusual and quirky male voices in the history of rock. Around the same time Tom was breaking through with his Small Change album, an unknown band from Crawley near Gatwick Airport in England was starting to build momentum. In 1976, they were known as Malice. Within a year, they'd call themselves The Easy Cure, and that would soon be condensed to just The Cure. Leading the band was Robert Smith. His older brother and sister had filled his head with Beatles and Stone songs, but they also subjected him to a lot of Captain Beefheart and David Bowie and Jimi Hendrix and Nick Drake. And then when punk came along, it was Sex Pistols, Ramones, Elvis Costello. Young Robert found his niche. Now, the voice. Robert Smith is a tenor who has experimented with several different styles of singing. He went through his punk period. There was also a soft vocal approach. And finally, he moved into, uh, well, however you want to describe how he sounds today. Uh, Call it agonized lover with plenty of yelping falsetto and the occasional low growl. Now, Smith doesn't really see himself as a singer, at least in the traditional sense. Here's a quote from him. In the early days, I never cared about giving a performance. I just worked myself up into the state of mind needed for the song, and that would be it. Some of the things I sang were pretty good, but a lot of it was out of tune. There was one point where I thought I was starting to get too predictable. So ever since then, I've tried to sing in different voices. I find it especially difficult to sing in a voice which is far removed from the way I talk. And I can confirm that. I've interviewed Robert on a number of occasions, and his speaking voice is very similar in quality to his singing voice. And it's a voice with impressive range. He reaches a very high D a D6, if you want to get technical, in Friday I'm in Love, the same song in which he goes down for a D3. Let's have a listen, shall we? The Cure with Friday I'm in Love. Featuring some very high notes and some very low notes from singer Robert Smith. Definitely one of the quirkiest male singers of all time. I have a few more unusual voices to run past you in just a second, and I'll be back with a guy who has done more with his yelpy sort of style than anyone could have possibly imagined. After looking at some of the most distinctive, unusual, and, I guess depending on your point of view, sometimes annoying female voices in the history of alt-rock, we're now doing the same for men. And we've reached the point where we must talk about David Byrne and the Talking Heads. I'd like to begin with this quote from Pauline Kael, the legendary film critic for the New York Times. Byrne himself is the parodist, and he commands the stage by his hollow-eyed, frosty verve. Byrne's voice isn't a singer's voice. It doesn't have the resonance. It's more like a shouter's or chanter's voice with an emotional carryover, a faintly metallic wail and you might expect it to get rather strained or tired. But his voice never seems to crack or weaken, and he's always in motion, jiggling, aerobic walking, jumping, dancing. They shade into each other. Byrne has a withdrawn, disembodied sci-fi quality, and though there's something unknowable and almost autistic about him, he makes autism fun. Wait a second, autism fun? Well, Byrne has been diagnosed as having Asperger's syndrome, which is on the autism spectrum. It's the mild end, but still. In fact, if you dig into the history of the Talking Heads' breakup, you'll find that their dissolution was more than just banned politics. Two of the other members blamed the death of the group on Byrne's autism. And, just so you know, Byrne acknowledges his diagnosis, but says that he's been able to work it out through making music. 
Now, doctors will tell you that he isn't cured. Instead, he'll say that he has it so well under control that it's nothing more than a personality trait rather than any kind of disorder. I'm not sure if any of this helps explain Byrne's singing style, but now that you know, how can you not wonder? Whatever the case, Byrne was very influential in introducing that yelping sort of singing voice that became very popular with some new waivers in the early 80s. There was Devo, there was Ongo Boingo, and there was Byrne. The Talking Heads with Life During Wartime featuring David Byrne. And not only is his singing voice quirky, so was his stage image at the time. He was all shifty and jerky. Any list of male singers with unusual voices has to include Leonard Cohen. And like Bob Dylan, Lou Reed, and Tom Waits, you can't really say that the dude sings. Singing involves hitting notes of a melody. It would be more correct to say that Leonard Cohen has a vocal style. It's a baritone that got lower and lower and lower the older he got. He's been known to reach down to a low G. And it's also become more gruff and less musical. It's more, I guess, method acting than singing. Or we can just say that uh, the man drones. This is not a criticism. It's whatever it takes to get the emotion across, right? But let me float this past you. How many women are there with this style? Maybe a better question is, how many women would get a record deal if they vocalized this way? Now, don't bring up Janis Joplin or Patti Smith because they do hit actual notes. Back in the 60s, Leonard tried. He was even promoted as a more musical Bob Dylan, but that was then. This is now. Leonard made a strange breakthrough into the alternative world in 1988 when his album I'm Your Man became a hit. From that record is this song, First We Take Manhattan. Listen for the low, low B flat. I'm coming now. I'm coming to reward them. First, we take Manhattan. Then we take Berlin. Leonard Cohen, very unusual voice. Yet his songs transcend what he can do with them. Just listen to what Katie Lang and Jeff Buckley did for Hallelujah. One more strange and quirky voice from alt-rock, and it belongs to Justin Hawkins of The Darkness. When we first started hearing about the band, and I guess it was 2003 with their Permission to Land album, the initial reaction was, come on, this is a joke, right? This guy's, this guy's making fun of Freddie Mercury of Queen. Uh, no, Justin was and remains dead serious. It's just that, It had been a long, long time since anyone used this kind of falsetto in alt-rock, if ever. Wait a second, hang on. Justin says he doesn't use a falsetto. I quote, I use head voice for softer high singing, but it's mostly high belt. Journalists call it falsetto, but that is mostly incorrect. If you're a singer, you'll understand what he means. If not, it means that Justin sings so that he feels the tone resonating in his head rather than in the throat or the chest, which is how he gets to all the high notes. The man does have a hell of a range. He can dig down to a low A, an A2 specifically, and as high as an E6. That's over four octaves, which is pretty impressive for a dude. So, is the darkness for real or just some kind of bizarre novelty act? I think if you surveyed the general public, the results might be about 50-50. Here's a sample. And there's an A from the fifth octave in here somewhere. Justin Hawkins and the Darkness from their 2003 album Permission to Land, and that's, I believe, in a thing called love. So let's review our list of the quirkiest male vocalists in the history of alt-rock. Lou Reed, Captain Beefheart, Russell Mail from Sparks, David Thomas from Per Ubu, Klaus Nomi, Tom Waits, Robert Smith of The Cure, David Byrne from The Talking Heads, Leonard Cohen, and Justin Hawkins of The Darkness. Our 10 kings of quirk. 
If you are looking for more information on this show, best email me at alan at alancross.ca. Try and set you straight with whatever your questions may be. Or you can go straight to my website, ajournalofmusicalthings.com. There's tons and tons and tons of stuff archived there. I also have a daily newsletter that you should consider subscribing to. It's free, and you'll never get any spam from me, I promise. Just sign up at the website. And I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and Instagram. In other words, there are plenty of ways that we can connect. And you know, we really should. I would like that very much. Again, start by emailing me at alan at alancross.ca. We'll get something going. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Before we leave today's Ongoing History of New Music podcast, uh, I want you to know that we're part of a network called Curious Cast. And Curious Cast has a lot of podcasts available on its network. And one of the new ones is called Art Cotex. And I have two of the hosts of Art Cotex with me here. Uh, we have Taj Krishlo and Director X. And we want to give you a bit of a, an introduction to what this new podcast is all about. So who wants to go first? And explain exactly what you guys will be doing. And obviously, here's a hint. If you're at the end of this podcast, my podcast, Chance Start has something to do with music. So our show is pretty much about, it's in the world of music. It's pretty much us sitting down with uh, storytellers that come from music videos. Uh, I feel like we live in a world where we don't give these, these amazing creative uh, artists uh, the flowers they deserve. They create some of the most uh, impactful uh, content on the planet that gets a lot of eyeballs on it. And coming from the world of music video, being in the business for over 20 years, we felt it was necessary to create a show like Architects to sit down and hear their stories, their come ups, their journey, their process of creating some of the most iconic music videos, films, and content on the planet. Now, you guys have been deeply involved in this world for, like you say, a long time. Who have you worked with? I've directed videos for Alicia Keys, Puff Daddy, Cisco, uh, uh, Destiny's Child, Drake, Justin Bieber, Two Chains, Rosalia, Iggy Azalea, Sean Paul, Beanie Man, um, Ariana Grande. Uh, well, you know. Okay, uh, now, now now you're just bragging. <laughs> <laughs> Corn, John Mayer, the list goes on. Like we, this has literally been um, a crazy journey, and and I would say X is the goat because as long as he's been doing it, like like late '90s to now, it's still relevant. You know, like we broke our our production company fella with uh, this music video for uh, for DJ Khaled, Drake, and Bieber called Pop Star. So it's 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 been a crazy journey, and um, there were two kids from Brampton, Ontario that uh, went out to, you know, make art that broke out to the world. And now we're using our podcast as another form of storytelling, but through an audio uh, medium. Okay. How are you going to make that transition? You've been telling stories through video. Now it's going to be only audio. So uh, you're going to have to change your style a little bit, I guess. I mean, we're talking to the creator, so it's a different kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, the, the story is the story of the maker. So it's not conceptualizing music and visuals to it. It's talking like the last, the first podcast, the debut of our, of the show was with Dave Myers. Um, another guy that's been in the game for a long, long time. And just talking about that, the philosophy behind his approach to art, the work he's done and, you know, as well, digging into some of the larger world issues out there. Like we have a whole talk about black lives matter uh, on that podcast and being a white director and his perspective coming up in a black music uh, world. So it's just a, it's a little different than what we're used to doing. Without any spoilers, give me the kind of stories that you'll be telling. Give me an example of a story. I guess the examples is pretty much their come up. Um, what they, what gravity, what, what drew them in to get into this world of uh, filmmaking, um, their influences, um, their highs, their lows, and pretty much their breakthrough moments. 
And, and a lot of times to your point, um, Alan, like when you watch a music video, you're just seeing the end result, but you don't see what, what went into to make that product and, and that, that piece of art as far as the storyboards and the, the art direction and sitting down with your head department and the collaboration. So it's pretty much, we're, we're, we're giving them that kind of, you know, close set behind experience where you get to see the process of how uh, we get to the finish line. Right. Because I've, I've always, I've often watched music videos and wondered where the hell did this come from? <laughs> what kind of headspace do you have to be in to come up with these images, these storylines, these, you know, things? Uh, and, and I have no idea. Yeah, it's, it's, and that's the point of the show. Like, look, we're probably like around the same age. Like I came up, I came up in the eighties era where that's what made me fall in love with music videos, right? The MTV much music era, watching videos by like Madonna and Peter Gabriel and like Phil Collins and, and Michael Jackson and, uh, uh, and Aerosmith. And I was always fascinated by music videos and the storytelling and the dancing and the style and all that stuff. And that's what got, that's what made us fall in love with the art. So imagine if you could go back in the days and sit down with Duran Duran and talk about the hungry, like a wolf video, like what the hell compelled you guys to be in this jungle and, and, and just going through this crazy, crazy story and sitting down with like, the best of the best and hearing their the stories of the directors working with Madonna and working with the stones. And that's the beauty about the show. It's like, we get that access to these filmmakers, to these artists. I've worked with the biggest and brightest artists in the entertainment business, but learn about that journey, that creative journey, that collaboration to make the work that we see that's now on television or on YouTube. And, and before we jump, I just want to say, please follow us at architects pods. Uh, I can't wait for this. Sounds like a great series. Looking forward to it. It's called Art Catex with Karina Evans, Tash Critchlow, and Director X. And uh, I can't wait to hear some of these stories. Thank you so much, you guys. All right.